Friends, colleagues, students and visitors, welcome to the Melbourne School of Design Dean's Lecture Series. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean at the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning here at the University of Melbourne. I begin today's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which this event is taking place, which may be multiple lands given the location of all of you. I'm currently speaking from Wurundjeri land and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the place of Indigenous knowledge in the Academy. The Dean's Lecture Series aims to connect the Melbourne community with international leaders in built environment fields. Today, our guests are Anton Garcia Abril and Deborah Mesa, founders of Ensemble Studio, an incredibly inventive and exciting studio. Anton and Deborah founded Ensemble Studio in the year 2000, and it stands out for their commitment to make space for experimentation in every project. Their internationally recognised body of work has advanced the fields of architecture and construction through their innovation of typologies, technologies and methodologies to address issues as diverse as the construction of the landscape or the prefabrication of a house. Each project embodies a balance between imagination and reality, art and science. Their studio manifesto champions the importance of raw materials and promotes the need to explore the origin of the process and the essence of elements and construction systems. It's through a thorough understanding of these elements that the studio succeeds in operating outside preconceived processes. Ensemble Studio featured as part of Architectural Digest's 2022 AD 100 list of top firms in architecture and design, and have received numerous awards over their 20 years of practice, including the 2021 Marcus Prize, the 2019 RIBA Charles Jenks Award, 2017 Architizer A Plus Award, 2016 NCSEA Excellence Structural Engineering Award, the Ikonov Chernikov Prize 2012, the Rice Design Alliance Prize of 2009, and the Architectural Record Design Vanguard Prize in 2005. In addition to running Ensemble Studio, Anton and Deborah founded a startup called WOHO in 2020, where they're invested in increasing the quality of architecture while making it more affordable by integrating off-site technologies. They're both closely involved in education, Anton being a professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Deborah holding the Ventilate Chair in Architectural Design at Georgia Tech. In today's presentation, Anton and Deborah will discuss the philosophy and methods behind their research and work, touching on Ensemble Studio, WOHO, and their university-based work. I'm very pleased to now hand over to Anton and Deborah. Welcome, and thank you for joining us here today. Thank you very much, uh, Yuli, and uh, all of the school for the invitation. It's for us a pleasure to be here with you um, online, sharing the work that we that we do. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna run a uh, a video that tells part of our story in a, not chronological or sequential order by, but by you know certain themes and topics that have been uh, chaining all our practice through the years. As you can see, now in the video, you see the same background that we have right here. This is our office in, in, uh, in the United States, in Boston, Massachusetts. And what's uh, important to us is that through the different works that we've been designing and, and mostly building through all these years, is that those works have allowed us to develop uh, topics that started with uh, the early works and have uh, enriched themselves and, and evolved and transformed throughout uh, every built work, uh, allowing us to in a way, approach architecture with uh, a lot of uh, responsibility, but also freedom. And uh, all our story as uh, architects start from a learning experience that we want to share with you in, in this uh, very vintage um, uh, handicap video. Where in our first missions, we 
we were eager to learn where all the material source and process starts. So all our origins are related to this quarry, to this uh, fundamental source of any material process. We needed to understand where matter comes from and what's the, what are the principles that, uh, that somehow rule in, 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 the, in, the, in the starting of any architectural process. Uh, these uh, early contacts with the uh, quarries uh, happened because we were working with stone as a new material for construction and we wanted to learn about the material. Um, and what's very important, and we realize when we look at the, the latest works, is how in, in these years is where we start to create an important understanding and link between architecture and landscape. Maybe not, not the kind of romantic idea of landscape, but how architecture and the actions that involve architecture affect the landscape and transform it sometimes beautifully uh, and sometimes very brutally. And, uh, and we need to be uh, you know, very aware and um, working with these conditions. Here you can see how we're learning, you know, how to, how to deal with the landscape in its bonus of quarry, no? uh, the tools and the systems that allow the construction of these, of these uh, uh, landscape tectonics and language. In the Here we were actually doing this mock-up uh, of, uh, of the wall that we were going to build in Santiago Compostela in a hybrid of a landscape intervention, we were recycling all these boulders that were due to their uh, irregular form, not prime uh, cubic pieces to be later on sliced in the industry protocols. Uh, but we were also learning how to industrialize or prefabricate this new um, um, language. And these two um, sessions have accompanied us to all our practice. Something that we discover in this project by moving away from catalog products uh, that uh, are more conventionally used and that contractors feel more comfortable using by, as Anton was saying, recycling or wanting to recycle instead material that was in the quarry but not, was not cataloged. Um, we realized how just this action that moves away from the norm creates a whole um, new situation for construction where we had in the end in order to make it happen assume the liabilities the risk become the contractors of the work um, in order to build in a non-conventional way that made a lot of sense of course if we think about um, sustainability but um, uh, was was hard to convince um, local contractors to develop it uh, themselves. Also, other than to explore our own, say, professional um, way of practicing our architecture, we're learning and discovering you know, the, the actions of, of weight, of uh, scripting a maneuver of how to uh, lift and uh, and move heavy parts no? and that's what dragged us to the next project that we were building pretty much simultaneously that was the Meroscopian house um, totally prefabricated sequence of assemblies where uh, off the shelf uh, and completely brain perfect pieces that come from civil engineering where Nissan Sen were put together to transform this, um, this kit of parts into a livable domestic house. In this case, we are using a lot of uh, parts. These are quick concrete beams typically used in civil engineering works, but we are placing them, designing with them in a non-conventional way to create or find what type of architecture and space this can create. 
uh, transported or tra transposed into a domestic uh, space, which is nothing but structural uh, kind of realm or domain where at least the parts typically uh, operate. Something that we have learned from the work in, uh, in Santiago, the previous work we were showing, is how when um, you know we are creating new ideas, these uh, also implies redefining the methodologies of construction um, that you see here. And also the scripting of this uh, sequence of events that had to occur to fabricate these uh, encounters between the different parts. Some of them impossible encounters that we were willing to, to reveal through its nudity, through its rawness, through its purity in the end. Uh, we uh, confirmed our early intuitions about architecture with these early two projects that the structure was the one that really had the capacity to, to, to detonate a spatial, spatial event. And in this house, we discovered that the seven days that took us to put all the pieces together after a long engineering period and the contracting management period prior to the factory, is the exact moment of closing the sequence of gravity and defining the spatiality of the structure was the definitive and seminal moment where we understood that the building, the space event, the structure, the equilibrium was complete. There was no further need to uh, embellish, to finish, to, to add ex extraordinary layers to this game. We thought that the equilibrium uh, the game of the assembly and the encounters that all these parts were generating were the ones that were responsible in architecture to, uh, to, uh, to, to create the space. And this space surprised us. It was not uh, a space that was referring to the weight of these pieces. It was a very light, transparent and permeable space. This is um, also our house in, uh, in Spain. So this is a space that uh, after designing and building that we inhabit and uh, where we learned, um, you know, almost for the first time, some of the benefits uh, logics of prefabrication in architecture um, you know but also how you know these type of systems that are highly engineered can create um, a different type of architectures that we were at this time not very familiar with but that we keep on working very intensely today also the the way this assembly connects with the the exterior, no? not framing through a window or not uh, uh, confining through walls that after are perforated or among two planes. It was just the three-dimensional permeable uh, uh, um, uh, space that went through the structure, but created that permeability. And this project took us to a, a next one. No? This next one was uh, the restoration of a historic building. And our challenge here was to insert this 50 tons prefabricated uh, bridges in the building without tearing the building down. So we engineered and we celebrated the rolling, like slightly almost the intermission of these um, beams to the windows of the of the existing warehouse. Uh, while in the Nerstopping House, we are creating uh, a new building here. The, the, the problem that we had was how to restore this historic warehouse in the slaughterhouse of Madrid uh, and how we could build inside 
adding the program that the client required, which is kind of a media tech uh, space dedicated to reading, how we could build the added square footage without, um, let's say, uh, eliminating the values of the interior space, which is this basilical uh, type of space that you will see here with also a very delicate metallic structure. So our intention was adding this new architecture, again, with an industrial um, language, like the language of the original building, but that was able to distinguish itself, that was able to uh, represent its time, and that would dance, so would follow the rhythm, and that's why it kind of follows the rhythm of the fenestration, but also the structure uh, would dance with the previous uh, structure to create a new space. These are two warehouses that are identical. Here you can only see one, but you can see in the video how some of these bridges uh, actually continue from this warehouse into the next one and uh, transforms two buildings into one. This uh, initiated a, uh, you know, a strategy of, of intervening in existing buildings that we have uh, continued in, in, in our practice is the idea of transplanting structure, the idea of honoring the existing structure of a building, if it has value, as it did in this case, and trying not to alter that, but inserting a new one. And in the friction of these two, even though they don't touch, and they have a different foundation, but the space collides and fragility of these vertical columns contrasts, as you can see, with the strokes of these lintels. And in between, the new spaces. Always, as we mentioned before, with the conviction that engineering construction and the technique is the ones that allows this you know, exciting expressions or actions of the existing. I think it's probably also very clear of how we see um, architecture where the concepts, in this case, the concept of bridging, bridging knowledge, bridging um, ideas, bridging buildings, um, and, and the actual architecture of it uh, and the actual construction of it become absolutely um, linked. And how there is a lot of care and a lot of thought placed into uh, not just the end result of something, but how this is created. What are the resources needed, the logistics implied in order to produce uh, the, um, you know, the best result. And this result is this um, dissonance among these two structures that don't fit together, but they work, they collaborate and they create together the space that is the result of the conjunction. The encounter of this. So we wanted to elevate this uh, infrastructural approach to design architecture. And we did this uh, prototypical adventures where we wanted to create certain uncertainties in terms of the design, but a clear logic and rule to provoke the three dimensionality of the urban event within, the, con within the, the lines and the borders of a vertical structure, you know, a superstructure that emerged over the fabric of a city. Superstructure was connected in different multi-levels and that owed its form not to the envelope like the conventional modernist uh, uh, structure, but to the spaces of this superstructure that was generated. This in different um, uh, let's say volumetric definitions, the, the super block uh, that somehow uh, resonates in the urban or, or the tower. These two typologies were somehow merged with the idea of a city and created this prototypical um, spaces that we are hoping to build uh, one day in the real fabric of a city. This project is really, we've been developing them in different sites uh, here in the Pop Lab at MIT, in our Maristopian house, uh, you know, trying to understand this more infrastructural uh, scale and how we can, uh, in a way, 
also prefabricate uh, small fractions of a city or buildings as cities where we develop in a way the kind of core and shell the main uh, infrastructure that we we'll feed we we'll hold the building but then allow change uh, to happen and also create um, architectures that are less uh, introverted when they have this big scale uh, and they are more more open more urban and they do have all the uncertainty the freedom and the and the fluctuant let's say, uh, in, in spatial conditions of the city. We don't want to, to uh, create those monoliths rather than a very permeable open structure. This tries to connect the, the logic of a house, the logic of a city, you know, through the usage of, uh, of these heavy parts. And uh, in our arrival to the United States, uh, we completed and continued a research that was ongoing in, in Spain of affordability in housing. This first project that we did in our backyard was a, a house built in, in, in form for uh, a, a call that uh, our Japanese colleagues did to architects after the, the tsunami uh, project. Events. And this was extended later on in a research project in, uh, in our pop lab where we wanted to get rid of the mass maintaining all the gravitas and all the weight of the tectonics. Somehow we were building with these air blocks following certain uh, compositional rules of the big cyclopean um, tectonics, but without the burden of the weight. As you can see, all these um, block piles were fundamentally air, but created the gravitas, you know, the weight presence, without having the burden of the mass. Yeah, with the Meroscopian house, with the Reader's house, and the other projects that we showed um, on, on built uh, with, uh, with parts that are fabricated in one place, transported to another. We understand the kind of uh, benefits, but also the limitations of prefabrication, weight being one of them, in order to transport, in order to rig and handle. Uh, and so here the exploration, uh, initially in the lab um, context, is how to uh, try to reduce the, the, the weight of, the, um, of these uh, elements as much as possible so that uh, prefabrication becomes uh, enhanced. And uh, with this uh, ultralight approach, we, we, we manufactured this um, 50 feet span beam eh? uh, with an extraordinary ratio of uh, of uh, resistance versus weight. No? We tested it, we post-tensed with this light gog galvanized steel studs, and uh, we immediately knew that we needed to build out of the lab. So we had this opportunity to, to build our own office above a, a garage that we acquired close to the MIT campus here in Brookline, where we actually live, where we are talking to you right now. And this was our mm, tenth, yeah? our parcel, a volumetric three-bay garage where we actually lived while we were doing the office above the home. We find this um, construction made of cement block, which, you know, it's beautiful but it serves as a beautiful foundation that we can build on top and so um, we start building and here we want to really um, kind of exploit this idea of lightness by fabricating you know not just next door or an hour away by truck but fabricating on the other side of the Atlantic here we are on a warehouse uh, in Madrid um, with our team and um, and fabricating these, uh, these components that will travel uh, to And in this case, also, um, you know, you can see a lot of the analogies to the Emeroscopian house, this 
uh, parts that try to maximize um, the size in order to minimize the maneuvers when rigging, but in this case, it has to fit uh, the, the shipping container dimensions. So there are limitations that we need to be looking at. We also need to pay attention uh, to the dimensions of the uh, existing building where we are going to be um, building. And uh, also may, maybe different from the Aeroscopian house is that these beams, these components are a bit more complex in the sense that they are not only structure and enclosure, but they start to integrate also uh, mechanical systems and, um, and uh, storage space, furniture. So they are kind of multi-purpose elements. I think this has been a major, a major milestone in, in our career because here we discover that we could actually fabricate our own parts. It's not taking a stone from a quarry or a given I-beam from a manufacturer. No, we actually could build our parts. And once we do them, it's not just the structure or the finished or the systems, it's all of above. And this somehow uh, was our uh, deep dive into the off-site construction. It's not just prefabrication, it's really to build the 100% of a building in a factory. And this is a seminal turnover in, I would say, not only in our career, I think uh, the spirit of the time today is that architecture is trying to find how to manufacture, how to fabricate integrally a building on a factory. And we did it here um, six, six years ago with this first house. And this opened us the, the, you know, the world of international offsite fabrication. This was a new terrain to conquer. So we decided to move from the office 20th century atelier to a factory. This is our new playground, our new place. We call it Ensemble Fabrica, where we will design, engineer, mock up, and fabricate integrally a building. And uh, to start with the fabrication of the own factory, we did that uh, prefabrication on the ground lift it into, into the proper, proper construction of our own home. Here again, you're seeing a, a, you know, a building that where we are the, the developers and, the, and the, the architects and the contractors in order to learn and to test these um, hybrid systems that uh, emerge with the Meroscopian house where we are combining different materials in different stages of the construction. Um, in order to maximize the, the, the whole uh, the value of the whole process. And here we started to think about, let's focus all our efforts for the attainability, the affordability of uh, the housing uh, 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 industry that really requires a lot of uh, intelligent actions to serve the environmental and social crisis that have created. So we, we created a new a company called uh, World Home that wants to honor the ecological mission for the world and the architecture wellness of, of having an amazing space to live in, in a, a very attainable place due to the uh, uh, industrialization of the process and the kit. So we started doing this uh, prototype that uh, has a combination of uh, pre-slabs in geopolymer and GFRC and a, non, a more advanced let's say, system of walls with uh, either nanocrete or CLT. In this case, this prototype is done in, in, uh, in, uh, in nanocrete. Here we in this space we design and we engineer, we uh, fabricate, we prototype and, and we measure. We measure, um, you know, the different parameters of time of construction, of performance of the buildings and systems. 
uh, which allow us to then uh, upgrade and uh, the, the architecture. No? So in, here we are thinking about architecture not as a one-off thing, but as a product, a product that can be um, enhanced uh, over time and, uh, and can be transformed, but that takes, uh, you know, departs from an, an idea of a system. And we're trying to achieve something that uh, the history of prefabrication has not yet accomplished is to make the universal unique, departing from a universal industrialized components that you know, serve technologically to the most advanced uh, protocols of fabrication, create always amazing, unique buildings. And now we would like to, to jump to the, um, to the other side of, of, the, of the moon, no? where all our uh, interest uh, resides in a novel interpretation, a novel relation between architecture and the landscape. This is something that in parallel to the technology has been obsessing us since the first day. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, the, the kind of research that we're going to show now uh, actually has a lot of relation to what we discussed uh, up to now, uh, where the previous research has to do with understanding materials, resources, optimizing them, understanding the impact that they have on the earth. In this case, we are working uh, with the earth as a material for construction to create an architecture that uh, blends with it, belongs to it immediately. And the same way uh, the Merskopian house try to emulate you know, an automatic assembly crane over the given components. Here, this is about 10 years ago, wanted to emulate an additive manufacturing process, like a 3D printing layer by layer, let's say, a, a process, continuous process where matter was deployed over an existing container mold, in this case here, and rendered uh, 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 surrounding this given volume. Uh, the technology was somehow serving uh, uh, a virtue of encounter with the natural environment, the natural place, the ground that was work with the materials that are on the side almost or around the site and reorganize them to create uh, architecture and, and then discover what this architecture can be. Like the truffle is a similar project where there is not a project that is fully resolved and done like in the previous projects that we've shown where everything has to be absolutely uh, engineered, calculated so that when things are placed on site, everything works as predicted. In here, there's a lot of improvisation that is allowed in order to, um, uh, in a way, also allow for a result that is not expected. And what I discovered was that the, the synthetic boulder that we had created was melted with the, with the earth where it was settled. It was like fully integrated. And we created this um, elegy no, of nature, a little poem where the, the vegetable uh, matter that was mixed with the soil, the, the hay no, as a module of, that comes from this agricultural uh, context, no? or the cow that we inserted into the space to uh, inhabit it and you know, carve out part of that uh, hay yeah, with our help and uh, contaminating yeah, through this long period of time that, that uh, mass yeah, prior to transforming into an habitable human space. 
we, we created this encounter between architecture and nature that in a surreal plane, we're capable to connect deeply with the materiality of its structure. As you can see, the, the contaminated concrete was offering different materialities. The, the viscous lintel of the, of the pressure in the, in the ceiling or the horizontal uh, contact with the hay that created that hairy concrete or the cuts to open that um, truffle and open that uh, window to devise and to visualize the horizon over the wrinkle uh, um, uh, um, uh, parts of the, of the surface. From a design point of view, this is a, a very revealing moment for us where we uh, are able to design and build something that, uh, you know, that we don't really know 100% what it's, uh, it's going to be like, not even a 50% what it's going to be like, and where we kind of understand the, the power of of the process, um, you know, when it is uh, really thought out and and uh, and, and designed, uh, you know, with almost more care than the than the final results, no? And and we are, uh, you know, we happily surprised by all of these textures, all of this detail, this articulation, this ornamentation in a movie that happens in the interior spaces by the kind of chemical reaction and contact of materials that has not been designed to the last wrinkle, uh, the kind of beauty you know, that, it, uh, uh, that it brings. Again, without the pressure and also the, the enormous effort of having designed every single move of it. And this really, really mm, mm, uh, trapped us and uh, and all this hidden beauty and all these uh, essences of architecture that were kept in this little truffle uh, remained intact in our, I would say, souls until 10 years later. We had this uh, opportunity to, to develop these sensibilities towards the landscape again in Montana, in a completely different place, on the other side of the world, in a, I would say untouched territory, just in the edge of Yellowstone Park, where the wrinkles of the mountains, of the Birdtooth Mountains, and the hills of this nature, nature, and, uh, and the wilderness were offering us the opportunity to have a, a, an intervention in a grand scale, but without any references. Any references of scale, any references of, of other architectures, just the pure wilderness of nature and the horizon and the references that we could be able to create. Here, uh, our client wanted to develop an art center in this um, 7,000 um, acre uh, plot of land, so really vast territory. And they wanted us to think about how this could happen to the land without being a kind of a white box type museum, but something that would be really integrated in the land that wouldn't become an obstacle or something totally foreign to it. So we start looking at systems of order like constellations that allow us to create some sort of master plan that makes more sense there. We start to brainstorm with uh, models. These are kind of our sketches, uh, working with the uh, materials, understanding that we're going to be working with earth, with rocks, uh, with conglomerates that will uh, fabricate again, like in the travel uh, architectures like rocks, uh, to develop uh, different spaces on the land. Instead of one building, uh, kind of an, uh, fragmented parts scattered across the territory that some become fountains, some become bridges, others become spaces for gathering or shelters, uh, spaces for music, viewpoints, um, essentially, just architectures that 
mediate between the vast scale of the territory and the human scale and allow the inhabitation of these uh, very extreme places on, on Earth. And we had to invent with this uh, fundamental principles the, the language and the materiality. We couldn't just take something that came from either the tradition of architecture or, or the industry. So we, we, we trusted the earth as canvas where we could, uh, with our hands, as you can see, direct uh, uh, a casting process over a carved out uh, earth mold and by unearthing, discovering the materiality that we had done. This was, it was a fabulous, exciting moment where we saw the transformation of these masses of, uh, of concrete that were born from the ground, not as pieces of concrete, no, as, as stones that were closer to the geological uh, nature of its fabrication than to the architectonic uh, uh, nature of the material. Um, this uh, transformation is uh, to serve, uh, I would say, a political and a spiritual mission that connects art, space, and the landscape. Something that we, we found it was a, a great uh, uh, encounter in, in Tippet Rice in, in the hills of Montana.
And now we are connecting these uh, mm, the sensibilities to these learnings so, of architecture and the landscape in, in different projects at different scales. We think that this architecture of the earth can unite different parts to the you know, common ground and uh, somehow be the cultural and uh, artistic evolution of architecture that will express this natural expressionism, new sensibilities towards our environment. We think that the, the mission of contemporary architecture is to find this encounter with the earth. And it's not only in through parameters of carbon footprint, it's through a cultural project, the same project that the art celebrated in the second half of the 20th century, you know, breaking all the rules and connecting with the deeper soul of the artist through the abstract expressionism. Architecture has to find this new language and use this materiality, this new deep connection with with the with nature, with the human and the physical nature. And this is the project that we're working now in different scales in in our landscape lab, Canterra, that we will show you the architecture of it, the learnings of it, trying to enhance this truffle and structure of landscape scale to a grander architecture and urban scales. Yes, we are very interested in uh, working on this, uh, designing what these typologies of architecture can be, architectures that are very linked to the earth, that they uh, sit on, not just uh, materially, but spatially. Um, and also in, in understanding other implications of this architecture in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, how they perform um, environmentally, how and, you know, they, they differ maybe from the um, notions of comfort um, and, uh, and you know, the type of technologies that we find in more conventional buildings and that will allow for, um, you know, an, a kind of a existence on the earth where architecture becomes more like nature and not uh, something that sometimes operates. Against it almost. This is the project that we're working right away. It's a museum in Korea in a, in a big garden, botanical garden, that will contain it's a patchwork, different paradises, gardens, from the traditional Korean garden to the Zen garden or a contemporary mineral garden. Uh, we wanted to create this cloth, this flower that somehow unearthed levitating from the existing ground hold this shelter. All this with a very complex wrinkle geometry that with this uh, baptism of water somehow revealed its topographical condition as a, as a, as a small pixel of the terrain that in this case we cut it and extracted to prefabricate it in an exhibition that we last uh, weekend presented in the Biennale of Landscape of Versailles. So in this uh, installation, we are taking, as uh, I'm saying, a pixel of the, of the building that we will do in, in South Korea and uh, studying how we can actually fabricate off-site mold um, in order to, a mold that can be then also recycled, a mold that can be very light to travel, and that will allow us to build full building one-to-one uh, -one first, before uh, we cast it and create the final form. And here you see where this invisible part of our structure, you know, the mold, reveals its nature, no? In this case, case it's, a, it's a 
carbon and fiberglass composites that is like a petal of a flower that owes its geometry and its nerves to the capacity to fold in any geometrical form and also could be cut in pieces, could be flat packed and transported and could be taken to another place where easily is mounted again. This artistic installation that is not really a pavilion or, a, or, a, or an art piece, it's actually a mock-up of the mold that we will later on cast for the project in Korea, but somehow it's initiating a topic that we are developing now in a summer studio that is the prefabrication of the landscape. We think that these two universes that have been always separated, the, ur the rural and the urban, the landscape and the, and the construction uh, fields, we think they can be united through technology. And this is a first approach of how this invisible part of the structure uh, relates to its transportability through its lightness and materiality, and how this would become the seminal part of the geopolymer and concrete structure that would be later on sprayed to create the form of the bigger structure in Korea. So this technological uh, advancement that we still, we just essayed in a, in, a, in a fraction of the structure is what will allow to, uh, to build and enhance this kind of architecture. And the, the building that uh, this mold uh, uh, you know, responds to, it's uh, located as, uh, you know, as the museum and uh, the entrance of, uh, to, to a garden of gardens. It is a very important um, part of it because it's a moment of kind of transformation or transportation, right? Where you go from, um, you know, the, the real world, uh, let's say, through this architecture into a paradise. No? That's the kind of idea that the client uh, has. So with the building, we want to create a completely different atmosphere that is very immersive um, and, uh, and kind of uh, enwraps uh, people and then uh, welcomes them into uh, the rest of the, of the site. And with this uh, same uh, immersive atmosphere uh, that the, the, the that nature provides, we would like to share with you this last project, Canterra, the house of the earth, our last house. And I would say also the first space that we could imagine uh, created by any human action, no? the idea of carving out a ground on the earth. We, we did find this, um, I would say, abandoned uh, mine where uh, all the layers of, uh, you know, of dirt abandonment and, 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 uh, and forg forgetfulness were printed on the, on the walls. So Canterra is um, an abandoned uh, quarry. It is uh, a very soft stone that was uh, carved, first exploited to build in the island of Menorca. This, there are a lot of uh, different caves in this island from very different periods, uh, you know, prehistoric um, monuments, prehistoric uh, also excavations, and then more contemporary ones. Uh, many of them are abandoned and they're used our, uh, as uh, dumpsters. And uh, we wanted to, we, we definitely recognize the kind of architectural value, although it was not architecture when we found it. And we had to do um, kind of very punctual, very measured actions to transform it into architecture. The most evident ones were to kind of excavate to discover the natural stone, to clean thoroughly um, and, uh, and also um, kind of level some of the ground. And then the main action becomes uh, the moment where we build with light, where we 
excavate once more the space to really transform it into architecture by allowing light and air to penetrate the darkest spot of the quarry uh, and therefore enable inhabitation. And with this uh, symbolic and performative action, with this tree that we helped after the impact you know, to, to, to survive, you know? and with this void that allows the light and the air to transform that space into a livable um, space, we somehow um, celebrated the birth of this um, uh, space and its transformation into, into architecture. Architecture that hosts life, and hosts inspiration and activity and, and everything that a uh, space uh, has to provide to, to, uh, to, um, to us. And, uh, and also has taught us uh, all the sides of the earth, how the earth works in terms of its bioclimatic balance or how the earth offers its material um, pressures, uh, textures and uh, surfaces without compromising and without uh, subduing to geometrical or, or formal imposition. So it's just pure space and matter. And with air and the energies of architecture and the gravitas of the materiality, there was a soul to sources that could create this space uh, from a landscape that was you know, uh, abandoned into a piece of architecture to, to be enjoyed. Um, and here we were definitely um, discovering a lot of uh, interesting things about architecture that we learned maybe in architecture school, but we had not experienced so profoundly. Um, but also we are learning about uh, you know, a, a way of being on earth that uh, is, is more connected and it's uh, uh, maybe more sensible and that we are, you know, very excited about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anton and Deborah. It has been an absolutely fascinating insight into your collective ways of thinking, the fusion, the melding of materials and making nature and landscape. It's just been an extraordinary journey to, for you to take us on and deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Please do visit the MSD website for details of our upcoming events and our YouTube channel to catch up on past talks. Coming up on the 26th of May, we do have the inaugural Miles Lewis oration with special guest Professor Alex Bremner of the University of Edinburgh. You can see the details on the slide here and you can RSVP and find out more details on our MSD website. Thank you all again for joining us. Good morning. <laughs>